Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mike Flanagan. Please go ahead. Hi. I'm Mike Flanagan, partner and co-chair of Foley's Food and Beverage Industry Team. I'd like to welcome you to today's web conference, Strategic Use of IP in the Food Industry. My colleagues joining me on the panel today are Rick McKenna and Charlie Carter. Rick McKenna is a partner and member of the firm's Food and Beverage Industry Team and also a member of the Mechanical Patent Practice Group and the Trademark and Advertising Practice Group. Rick has a broad range of experience in IP prosecution, counseling, and enforcement, and has assisted clients in securing patents and trademark rights directed to diverse food innovations, such as a recipe for a low-fat ground beef product, a process for packaging soft cookies, machinery used to create candy, and the shape of snack food products. Charlie Carter is a partner and a member of the firm's chemical, biotechnology, and pharmaceutical practice, as well as the firm's food and beverage industry, life sciences industry, and energy industry teams. Dr. Carter's practice focuses in the areas of client counseling, licensing, risk assessment, and strategic development of IP portfolios relating to U.S. and foreign patents in chemical, pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and material science technologies. Before we start, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping tips. A copy of the slides can be found in the materials section of your screen. Uh, we encourage you to submit questions electronically throughout the web conference by using the Q&A tab. And Foley will apply for one hour of general CLE credits for today's program. All New York, New Jersey, and Kansas attendees applying for CLE credit must fill out an attorney affirmation form and write down the course code that will be announced at some point of the webcast. The attorney affirmation form can be obtained in the materials section on your screen. Now, I'm very pleased to turn the program over to Rick McKenna. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good it's afternoon here in uh, Milwaukee, so good afternoon to everyone out there. I uh, appreciate your joining us today. I'm going to talk about uh, the overlapping uh, protections that are available uh, for Non, uh, for non-functional elements. We're going to use design patents and trademark strategies to, to protect different uh, non-functional elements. And I want to underscore a comment that Mike made earlier as far as asking questions. You, you should see the Q&A box on uh, the screen you're looking at. Please, uh, if you have questions as we're going along, please submit the questions and, and we'll do our best to ensure we get all your questions answered during the uh, presentations. So as I suspect most of you know, uh, innovations in food products can be used as a way of distinguishing your products from those of your competitors. And it's important in this competitive marketplace that we have in, today to, to take steps to proactively protect those innovations uh, using the various IP tools that are out there and available to us. These IP tools can create an effective barrier or, or uh, Barriers for competition, competitors, or or really can can uh, make it more difficult for your competitors to launch their products in the marketplace. So we're going to divide up the innovations into two different baskets. The first basket is the functional innovations. Those are typically protected via utility patent or via a trade secret. And uh, Charlie's going to touch on some of those issues. So I'm going to. Uh, Step, step aside on that issue and let Charlie take the lead on that. I'm going to talk about the ornamental, non-functional innovations that uh, are sometimes you know, in, integrated into food products or the packaging for food products. We need to keep that in mind that we're talking both about the product itself or the packaging that's used to sell the product. And as I mentioned earlier, there are two different tools available to us to protect these uh, non-functional innovations, and those are both design patents and trademarks. So this is just a, a, a quick comparison of some of the key uh, rights for design patents and trademarks. Uh, one important issue to keep in mind is when does your protection begin when you're protecting an innovation via a design patent? Uh, and, and the key thing is it begins immediately upon issuance of the design patent. So you file your design patent, it will take several years, or several months at least, perhaps years, to issue. And the moment that that issues, you can go out and immediately go out and start to enforce that, uh, 
that IP asset against competitors who may be infringing it. Compare that with a trademark where typically you have to use the, the, the non-functional innovation in the marketplace for many years and have to develop that consumer goodwill before you have an asset that can be enforced in the marketplace. So that's one key distinction between the design patent and trademark protections is how quickly can you bring an enforcement action. Another key distinction between these two uh, aspects of protection is what is the term of protection and for the designers from when the design patent issues. That's soon going to change to 15 years, but for the time being it's currently 14 years. And at the end of that period of time, uh, according to law, the competitors are free to, to copy what's in your design patent and use that. However, if you have been proactive and have secured trademark protection for the same innovations that are seen in your design patent, you can use a trademark as a basis of basically extending your protection in this uh, non-functional innovation. And the trademark protection will last uh, an unlimited term. It lasts as long as you continue to use this trademark in the marketplace and continue to draw consumers' attention to it and, and uh, treat it like a trademark. And we'll talk about that a bit more a little later on. Again, the scope of protection uh, for these two uh, forms of protection, it, it, they, they overlap. They both are directed to non-functional ornamental features, which are embodied in the product itself, the shape of the product, or the packaging for the product. So those are a couple of the key distinctions between design patents and trademark protection. There are other ones, but uh, those are the ones I wanted to highlight in our, in our discussion. So what I'd like to do is to, is to lay out a multi-step strategy that, that you can follow to protect your non-functional innovations. And um, the first step in that strategy is to secure design patent protection. And you, you do have to move relatively fast to, to, to protect your design patents, depending on whether you want U.S. or foreign protection for this, because uh, failing to promptly act and, and, and make your filings on the design patent side can result in an abandonment of your or, or loss of your ability to file for design patent protection. So you have to file relatively promptly. And we are in, in a first-to-file environment now in the Patent Office, so there's motivation uh, and incentive to file as quickly as possible, as quickly as you've gotten the, uh, as soon as you've come up with the innovation and you're ready to, to file, you ought to move ahead with that. So again, the design patent will protect an ornamental design. Uh, once you file your application, uh, the design patent will issue typically 12 to 18 months thereafter. It can be longer, can be slower. It all depends on how busy the particular office within the patent office that you're dealing with uh, might be. And, and it also depends on how, uh, whether you run into any kind of uh, uh, rejections issued by the patent office during the examination process. It's important to note that the contents of your design patent application will remain secret until the design patent actually issues. This is a difference from the utility patent side of uh, uh, the world where those patent applications are published after 18 months. On the design patent side, it remains secret. So one option would be you could file for design patent protection. If you never get the design patent, then that application and the existence of that application will remain secret. Um, and competitors can't see what you're trying to get protection for until the patent actually issues. The cost estimate for a design patent it typically is under $3,000, assuming you don't run into any uh, rejections or objections from the uh, patent office. Um, so it's, it's not a, a costly process, typically, to get a design patent. Although I, I, am speak, I keep speaking about a single design patent, and, and actually it is more common that a single product will result in multiple design patents as you protect different aspects or elements of the product. So have a single innovation that you're trying to protect, it may actually result in three, four, five, six different design patents. Okay, so we've filed our design patent. The design patent is issued. Now step two of the process is to, is to maintain our ex exclusive position in the marketplace. And, and as we mentioned earlier, your exclusive rights or your ability to keep competitors out of the market, marketplace 
springs into existence as soon as the patent issues. So now that you have your design patent, you can use this as, as an offensive weapon to keep your competitors away from your innovation and maintain that exclusive position in the marketplace. And as I mentioned earlier, it's the term for this protection is 14 years, soon to be 15. For those of you who have experience in uh, trademark infringement battles, you know that sometimes a challenge can be to prove uh, the necessary consumer confusion. And uh, when you're dealing with a design patent, an infringement of a design patent, we have a slightly different standard. We don't have to prove consumer confusion. All we have to do is prove that the, the designs are substantially similar in the eyes of an ordinary observer. So it's a different standard uh, than what we have in the, in the trademark world. Um, I, I tend to think it's a lower standard than what you have in the trademark world, but some might disagree with me on that. Step number three in the process. So we have our issued design patent, and we are keeping competitors out of the marketplace using our design patent. And during this period of time, we want to proactively build consumer recognition and association of this design. We want consumers to think about when they see this particular design, and they want to, it, we want them to associate it with you as the source of this product. So some form of advertising and promotional efforts during this uh, period of time when you have the design patent is, is important because it helps you build your trademark rights and your efforts in advertising and promoting the, the, the innovations as your trademark uh, will be necessary when the time comes that you seek registration of this mark with the trademark office. So you have the, the, the design patent gives you a great opportunity for exclusivity. Now is your time to, to use that opportunity and do some advertising. Um, Again, you want to draw the consumer's attention to whatever this unique shape is, or the, 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 the design is. And when I talk about advertising here, I'm not saying you need a multi-million dollar television ad campaign uh, drawing consumers' attention to this. So with, with the uh, internet and social media uh, opportunities that we have these days, you can do an awful lot of, of advertising of these kinds of issues fairly inexpensively with some creative social media advertising. Um, so that might be a great way to start to build the case and, and, and build your evidence of, of promotion of the trademark without investing a great deal of money. So step number four in the process, now we've got our, uh, our design patent. We've been keeping the market to ourselves. We are, uh, have been advertising it. And eventually, the time will come where we're going to go and actually file for registration of the design as a trademark. And uh, there is a, a time, a period of time, uh, typically five years after you've started actively promoting this, that you would then file your application. You don't have to wait five years, but that's the, the default, the assumption at the trademark office that you've, if you've used and promoted a particular design for five years, then uh, after that point in time, there's enough consumer recognition associated with the product that you're entitled to registration as a trademark. The, the, the register, for, again, for those of you who have experience in registering trademarks, um, the, when you go to register a design uh, such as this, the trademark office will, as a matter of course, reject the application. They're going to force you to submit uh, declarations and other evidence proving that you have used this uh, non-functional design as a trademark. Uh, so. It, 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 this is a process that, that could take more time than uh, some trademark registration applications and could take more money than some trademark registration applications. But uh, in the end, if you've collected your evidence uh, of, of advertising over the years and you've waited at least five years, uh, chances are you'll be able to get, this, get a, a design registered. One of the things that you have to assert when you're filing your trademark application is you have to assert that, that you have made continuous and exclusive use of this design in the marketplace for five years. And having that design patent gives you the ability to make that continuous and exclusive claim because you've got the design patent, which has been, a, been your tool to keep competitors out of the marketplace. So you, as you see, these, these two tools work together as a basis for, for protecting your innovations. 
So the fifth step in the process is to uh, you know, continue to exclude your competitors from the marketplace. So now uh, we have two tools to use, two weapons in our arsenal to bring against the competitor. We can use our design patent, which lasts for 14 years. We can use the trademark registration once it's once it's granted. So uh, there, are oftentimes, if you follow the strategy I've laid out here, there will be a period of time where you'll have the opportunity to bring a design patent infringement claim or a trademark infringement claim or both against a competitor who happens to bring in a, a similar uh, design. So that can be a very valuable tool. Uh, another valuable tool from an enforcement perspective is when you have these, these, the design patent and the trademark registration in hand and a competitor launches a, a, an infringing product, being able to send a cease and desist letter in which you can attach these, the trademark registration and the design patent can be very effective for getting competitors to back off and move away to something different. Uh, when you send a letter that just asserts that you have rights in the design without any form of uh, verification from the uh, patent office, uh, you know the, the letter may not carry much weight. But when you can include these attachments and, and, and make the allegations as, as far as the rights you're entitled to under these registrations, uh, that form of cease and desist letter carries far more weight, at least in my opinion. I've had pretty good success in sending letters when we've got those types of, uh, of support for, for our claims. So that's the five-step process that, that um, I would suggest people uh, pursue if, if possible. And what I wanted to do now is to just talk about some examples of some design patents and trademark registrations that we see in the food industry. And on the design patent side, uh, th this is the first page of one design patent. This was uh, issued by Mars. I'm sorry, issued to Mars for a design uh, embodied in a, uh, a candy bar. And as you can see, we're looking at a per perspective view of a bar of candy and the little breakaway sections of, of pieces of cho chocolate, I assume, that, uh, that, that makes up this bar. Um, so again, this patent would last for 14 years from the, uh, from the uh, issue date. I am a fan of uh, chocolate, so you, you're going to see a theme here uh, in my examples. Um, I believe these are the individual uh, squares of a Dove bar, that uh, the little bite-sized Dove candies that uh, uh, Mars has. And here's a, a different variation where they appear to have these uh, all stacked together in some sort of breakaway version. So um, Mars has secured design patent protection for that embodiment of their, their candy bar. And, and, and here's one important thing to think about. If Mars secured design patent protection for the individual piece of, uh, of the Dove bar, they could always come back later and file for this version where they've put five together in a, in a combined stack. And that might be a way of, of uh, extending some of the protection that they're uh, entitled to. So there's a variety of options that, that you can pursue as, you, as your product morphs and changes over time in the marketplace. Here's another uh, product. This is a, a cracker of some sort, um, and, and it has a creative title of a curved trapezoid food product. Um, this is issued to the Kellogg Company, but uh, this is some sort of cracker. So uh, again, that they're protecting in this uh, uh, design patent the, the curved sides of the of the cracker and the, the curved top and bottom of the cracker. So there's uh, a, a non-functional ornamental shape that they're protecting here. Here's another one. Uh, this is uh, from Kraft Macaroni and Cheese. Uh, this is Kraft, uh, as some of you may know, uh, sells macaroni and cheese where the macaroni uh, pieces are in a variety of different shapes. This is one that's intended to resemble the United States or map the US. So again, uh, Kraft has <clears throat> you know, uh, 14 years of exclusivity with this particular design. It's, it's important to note, uh, I should say also, that uh, while Kraft may be selling macaroni with this shape, if someone wanted to make a piece of chocolate that had this shape, uh, you know, there would be the ability to use this design patent to stop someone from selling chocolate in that shape. You may not be able to use a trademark as the same basis because you may have a different consumer base uh, that, you're, that you've got, but certainly from a design patent, uh, you, you have some, some breadth there that you don't have with a trademark enforcement. 
Uh, here's another design patent. This is for Procter & Gamble on, on some sort of uh, chip shape, a snack food product. Um, and uh, I don't recall seeing this particular product in the marketplace, but uh, uh, Procter & Gamble has some sort of protection on it. I mentioned that there was that, that, that you could protect the packaging of the food product, not just the, uh, the food product itself. And here's an example. This is a Nestle bottle that uh, has been protected via design patent. There's, there's an incredible amount of bottle art uh, that's been protected uh, via design patents. Um, so this is just one example. Now let's, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about trademarks. Uh, here are some examples that I have of some registered trademarks. And many of these will be familiar to you because, again, you'll recall with the trademark registration, you have to have at least five years of use of the, the, the shape in the marketplace and it has to be a, a continuous and exclusive. So many of these products are well known to you, I suspect. Uh, the pictures on the right are what I have added. It's the trademark registration is what you see on the left-hand side here. But this is the, uh, what is well known to me, again, the Toblerone chocolate bar, one of my favorites, um, the triangular shape. So uh, they have a trademark registration on, the, on one individual piece of the Toblerone chocolate bar. Um, it's possible they may also have registrations for the, the complete bar and for the packaging for the bar. I haven't looked that up, but it's uh, quite possible they would have registrations for that. Uh, and again, this, this registration will last for as long as the uh, Toblerone bar continues to be sold in the US market. Another one, uh, this is Tostitos. This is the, uh, the Scoops chip. Um, they have a, a registration for that uh, particular configuration of the, of the chip. and. Uh, Although this is uh, Rico as the owner, it's actually Frito-Lay is the, the owner of this registration. Um, <clears throat> and again, this, this registration will last and be protectable for as long as uh, Scoops continues to be in our marketplace. Another one of my favorites, Teddy Grahams. Uh, they have a trademark registration for uh, one of the shapes of the bears. I don't know if, if you've ever had this product, but there's typically, I think, three or four different shapes in each box depending upon the arm position of the, uh, of the particular character. And uh, while I've only given you one example here, Nabisco does have uh, multiple, e each of the different shapes of their, their Teddy character uh, registered as a trademark. And another one, breakfast cereal. This is the, the well-known honeycomb product. This has been out in the marketplace for many, many years. Uh, the first use dates back to 1965. So. Uh, they clearly have their, their five years of use in the marketplace. Um, and uh, back to the, the packaging of the product, there's a trademark registration here for a bottle shape. This is a, a bottle held by Coca-Cola. But again, uh, it's a matter of proving use of, of, of the, the configuration in the marketplace and submitting evidence of that use uh, to the uh, trademark office and getting a registration. I want to do briefly in the few minutes I have left, I'll, I'll move quickly. This is a, a quick case study on a product called the Pretzel Crisp. I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is a, one, of, one of my favorite products. I, I enjoy this an awful lot. Th this is a product which dates back to 1995, and it was uh, originally created by uh, Warren and Sarah Wilson. They uh, came up with this design for a very thin-shaped uh, snack cracker that, that looks like a pretzel. and um, the, the, th the theory was, I believe, that, that they wanted a product that had just the crunchy exterior of the pretzel, pretzel but didn't really have any of the, uh, the interior of the pretzel. So it's a very thin product. Well, uh, pretzel, the, the, the Wilsons secured uh, their first design patent back in 1996 for this product. Uh, the picture that you see on the right is, is the picture of, of the, the, the current embodiment of their commercial bag. So. The Wilsons took this, they did their initial filing back in 95, and they, they took this product uh, a step further, the, or their protections a step further. They didn't limit their protections to just that conventional pretzel shape. As you see on the right here, there are many other shapes that they have gone ahead and registered as uh, design patents, and I, and I call these defensive filings. They've been very proactive in, in pursuing design patent protection for alternatives of the uh, uh, of this, the shape of this product. And the reason for doing that, obviously, is to keep competitors at bay and, and keep them away from uh, 
similar shapes if, if someone wanted to bring in a competitive product. And as you see here, there's uh, some shapes that have been protected that uh, have uh, two holes or one hole or no holes and, and some that have the little uh, tabs sticking out the bottom of the, of the chip and some that don't have those tabs. So uh, this is just an example of some of the different filings that, that uh, the Wilsons have pursued uh, from their original filing. And uh, following the strategy that I outlined earlier, the Wilsons have gone ahead and uh, secured trademark, or registered trademark protection for the shape of their, of their product. Um, and the trademark registration you see on the left there, and again, the commercial product is seen on the right. And um, so now they, they have those two tools available to them, the design patent. Actually, the original design patent has, has uh, uh, expired by now, but they still have the trademark registration to rely upon as a tool to uh, to go after competitors. And, and I believe some of the other defensive patents, design patents, have not yet expired. And here's an interesting strategy that that uh, uh, the Wilsons I don't I don't believe own this product line anymore. I think it's owned by another party now. But uh, this is a product that you see at Trader Joe's. It's the two-hole version of um, the, the pretzel crisp product, and um, uh, my guess is is that uh, the, the company that owns pretzel crisp now has licensed uh, this design patent, the two-hole design patent, to Trader Joe's, and so therefore now they have a valuable asset that they can license uh, and, and presumably uh, generate some revenue, some licensing revenue from from uh, the sale of this, and being able to give an exclusive product to uh, Trader Joe's. And uh, for those of you that get in that market of, of, of selling uh, products to big, big big retailers like uh, Trader Joe's, they typically want exclusivity on something. So the design patent uh, can give you a way to, to do that. So here, here's a, a product that gives you a way to generate some revenue. And lastly, I want to show you, again, this is part of our case study. This is uh, the rolled gold product, which uh, has come in the marketplace within the last year now. And as you can see, uh, rolled gold has uh, used kind of a figure eight shape for their product, um, and and you know think of the process that Rolled Gold had to go through to to, to develop this product. They had to research all the different uh, design patent filings that the Wilsons had secured, and develop a design that was different from that and avoided both the trademark and design patent rights that the Wilsons had secured. And, and uh, their solution to that problem was this figure eight design. So. Um, if you go in the marketplace now, there are now at least two uh, products, two, two, two examples where you can buy this this product, uh, one being Rolled Gold, one being Pretzel Crisp. But uh, to my knowledge, I think the, the Wilsons had the exclusivity in the marketplace for many, many years. Um, and and I, I think that the design patents and trademark protection they secured contributed in, in, in great deal to that exclusivity in the market. And I am out of time, um, so I'm going to, uh, Mike, were there any questions that came in? Uh, Actually, Rick, you, your presentation was great, and it triggered a FURIA question. Um, no. What I would like to do is uh, uh, give you a chance to respond to a couple of them now, and then uh, if timing permits, we will back for the rest of them following Charlie. Um, the first one that came in related to the combination of design, patent, and trademark rights. Can design patent and trademark rights and food products be secured in countries outside the U.S.? Um, the, the answer is is yes. Obviously, every country is different. Um, but uh, on the design patent side, um, many countries have what's called absolute novelty, which and what that means is that you have to have a patent application on file in the U.S. before you publicly disclose your invention. So if you want to pursue this strategy that we uh, outlined uh, outside the U.S., you have to be very proactive and, and get that design patent on file before you actually launch the uh, product in the marketplace and start trying to sell it. Once you've disclosed this uh, in the marketplace, then in many countries outside the U.S., you lose the opportunity to get design patent protection. Next question. You mentioned promoting and advertising the product design to build trademark rights. Can you explain further what types of advertising would be necessary to build these rights? 
Yeah, I mentioned, uh, you know, like a national ad campaign, and, and although the one that I always like to, to reference that I think is quite effective, it's, it doesn't deal with a, a non-functional shape, but it's a, certainly a non-traditional trademark, is the color brown for uh, UPS. Uh, you may remember their, their advertisements a couple years ago of what can brown do for you and, and uh, always kind of promoting the color brown. And I, I think that was a very effective national campaign. It's, that's obviously very rare that someone is going to do that, but you know, that's one end of the spectrum. And I think the other end of the spectrum from a, a money perspective is, as I mentioned earlier, the social media type uh, campaign of sending out uh, uh, Twitter uh, or, or, or Facebook posts or things like that, you know, that, that stuff is uh, pretty inexpensive to create this stuff and, and put it out there. And as long as you keep a copy of this in, in an archive of these efforts in, in, in advertising and promoting this, that's what you need on the trademark side to prove you have trademark rights. And then if you get into litigation down the road, you, you also want to have that available to prove your efforts in, in trying to create the exclusivity in the marketplace and consumer recognition. Thanks. Um, as I said, a couple more questions, and we will we will do our best to get to those before the end of the program. Uh, but now, what I'm going to do is switch over to Charlie Carter. Charlie. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Rick. Um, I'm going to talk about another prong of intellectual property protection that's potentially available, um, and that can be pursued in parallel with the type of rights that Rick has just talked about. Um, these are what are referred to as utility patents or regular patents. Um, they are directed at the functional aspects of food or ingredients or some of the other um, aspects relating to food products that I've listed here. Um, the Advantages of functional the utility patents are that they have a longer lifetime, 20 years from um, their filing date, enforceable once they're issued. They also offer the possibility to get more extensive coverage depending on the way the invention is defined and granted by the patent office. The I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the procedural requirements, but they they need to be novel. They need to be not obvious in view of previous products. Uh, with recent changes in the law, um, it is best to have filed an application before you start to sell or market your product. There are still somewhat of a grace period, but we are getting closer to the absolute novelty requirement that Rick mentioned. Uh, for foreign design patents, which is also true for foreign utility patents. Um, but I think, and it, typically they will take longer to be issued by the patent office, although there is procedures to try and accelerate that. Um, but I think it should just be thought of as a, a parallel prong that can give you, if, if the opportunity in the situation affords it, uh, broader stronger uh, protection of the functional aspects of a new innovation. Um, so what I'm going to try and do today is go through some older patents that have been enforced that will illustrate some of the types of um, basis for product patents or method patents relating to food. And then the big thing that has happened is about a year ago, most of you have probably heard about the Supreme Court's myriad decision that was focused on genes and the ability to patent genes, but potentially has much broader aspects, much broader applications to anything that's a natural product. And in particular, the US Patent Office has issued guidelines to its examiners as to how to deal with product patents or patents relating to, potentially relating to natural products in view of the Myriad decision. Um, and the Patent Office's position, as I'll talk about in more detail, 
has been somewhat controversial with their interpretation and I think most attorneys would say is almost certain to evolve as the case law evolves over the next few years, but um, is something that everyone needs to be aware of. So I'm going to start now. I've, I've listed a, a not just food products, but other aspects of food products here. Uh, food products that may include a new ingredient, um, new ways of processing uh, food to make a food product. There, that's something you always would want to evaluate in terms of is it worth it to keep this a trade secret, or if it's something other people are going to be able to figure out, is there value in um, patenting the method? And as I'll come back and talk to you in a few minutes here, particularly in light of the Supreme Court decision, there may be some substantial value in having method patents in addition to just patents on the product. Um, Rick has talked about the shape or configuration of food being the basis for design or trademark rights, but if that shape has functional properties, it also can be covered by a regular utility patent as well. And then, just to be complete, I'm not going to talk about this much today, but when you're thinking of food products, either the packaging or the delivery method for the food in some special way, if it's innovative, may also provide opportunities for patent rights, which again can give you potentially a 20-year exclusivity window to use that product. So what I'm going to do here is go through sort of very briefly a number of instances where people successfully enforced food-related patents over the last 10 years or so. Uh, and all of these were cases that were either settled or um, finalized before the Supreme Court Myriad decision. I'm going to talk about the Myriad decision, and then I'm going to come back in with some of these uh, products looking at the claims in a little bit more detail to talk about whether these patents would still be enforceable post Myriad or not. Um, but the, the first instance I've here I've got is Mars came up in um, Rick's talk. I've got a couple examples of Mars patents here. They seem to be very effectively using patent rights to provide exclusivity uh, for their innovative food products. Here, it, this is an animal food where it was really almost on a macroscopic scale, something where part of the food was encapsulated um, by the other aspect of the food product. They called it the, a dual texture pet food that was made by an extrusion process. Think of that as a, if, for those of you that aren't, uh, chemical engineers is sort of squeezing things out of a, a tube that's being heated um, through a, some kind of nozzle. But these, there was a pair of patents that were enforced. This resulted in $3.6 million in damages, but likely as well the ability to take the other product off the market. And between the two patents, there was examples of both claims to the product itself, as well as to the process that was used to make um, this innovative product. Um, here's two other um, patents more recently uh, concluded litigation where you can see the damages are starting to get into larger numbers. Um, the first one had to do with a method of really lowering salmonella um, problems in eggs by pasteurizing the in-shell egg under certain types of conditions. Again, this was a patent where there were claims to both food product 
the pasteurized egg as it's defined in some way, and process claims. Um, and there was $6 million in damages awarded in this case. Um, the second one, V. Maine, V. International Flavors and Fragrances, had to do with a new additive. This was a, what I would call a menthol flavored additive, but it wasn't menthol per se. It wasn't the natural menthol ingredient that you would that was added to a whole variety of foods or chewing gum and things like that. And here, the damages awarded as a result of the suit were $40 million. So we're starting to get into some very substantial litigation here. Um, here's three cases, two uh, products, two of which um, are would be fairly well known, uh, where the actual amount of damages was not um, disclosed, but it was successful in taking the other products off the market. Uh, the first, and I've listed the patent numbers here, was the, an older patent uh, that was enforced by Ocean Spray much more recently to their Crazen product. Uh, when we get back to it, I, if, if there's, we get time here, you'll see a little bit more of exactly what's going on, but there's both food product and process claims here. Um, Mars has a patent on a cocoa bean extract that has certain uh, medicinal applications. Um, there was only process, product claims in this case because, as you'll, as you'll perceive, see, the process itself was very not particularly unique. It was just the properties in the particular extract that they were obtaining. And then finally, this Lycorid patent was one where they basically processed the tomato in ways that took it apart into various fractions and then put some of those fractions back together. And they had both product and process claims in this case. Um, so that was sort of the landscape. And people were enforcing patents in the food area. Many of those, a number of those, with purely what I would characterize as natural products um, to be the ingredients in whatever combination they were claiming as a food product. Um, and then about a year ago, the Supreme Court came out in the Myriad case and reversed what had been the status quo for quite some time there are a large number of patents to specific genes that had been isolated by various scientists that just claim the, ge the isolated gene outside of its native cell. So really, no different in sequence, no, no different from the gene itself, but it was isolated. And, and the basic ruling of the Supreme Court is the mere isolation of that natural product is not a patent, not patentable subject matter. It's still something that exists in nature, is not quote made by the hand of man, and that isolated process, isolation process, is not enough to um, get over the re the requirement that it's a judicial exception, but it's a long-standing one that products of nature are not patentable. And this applied to fragments. If you took this isolated gene and just cut it up into little pieces, but all the little pieces were pieces that existed in that gene, if it was intact, those are still not patentable either. Um, they're still ruled to be natural products. But closely related DNA sequences, and I won't get into the molecular biology, um, that really have to do with the gene being cut into pieces and then certain pieces with gaps missing being spliced back together so they were not naturally occurring sequences were still ruled to be patent eligible because here the argument was there was the intervention of the hand of man in creating something that did not exist in this form in nature. 
Uh, as part of this ruling, the Supreme Court expressly indicated that it was not, there were no method claims. This was only ruling with respect to product claims. There were no method claims in the case before it, and it was not extending this ruling uh, that far at this time. And they also made a point of pointing out that new uses for an existing natural product, so a use claim, and in particular example they gave were pharmaceutical treatments, uh, new treatments of diseases that were um, not known before, would be one area that would still be available for patent eligibility even though the product was known or the product was a, quote, natural product. Um, the Patent Office then issued, shortly after that decision, some guidelines to its examiners to, especially in the molecular biology area, uh, to how to treat the examination of patents directed to genes but also to um, natural products more broadly. And then recently, in March of this year, they released a more extensive, somewhat reinterpretation of those guidelines um, that really got people's attention. Uh, and, and now I've, I, I want to talk about those briefly, but in the, the new 2014 version of the guidelines, they made a point of emphasizing, and I think it is fair to say that the Supreme Court, although they limited their ruling, it was limited to genes, it clearly had implications that went beyond genetic material to other natural products. But the extent of that interpretation was not completely clear and was obviously going to be left to the courts to work out over time. But the, the Patent Office has kind of jumped in with two feet, and, and I've listed, and, and this is the Patent Office's listing, all the different categories of natural products that they were going to look at this myriad-type treatment uh, with respect to. And right there in the second line, you can see our food products. Um, and, and some of the examples I'm going to show here will come from some other categories. But the, they listed a 15 or 16 factors that could potentially be used in the analysis, but the two most important ones for natural products, natural, which would relate to food products, are the two here. If the claim and, and the examiners have been told to be basically very conservative in their initial cut so that if it looks like it might be a natural product, they're then to proceed and use this 15-factor analysis to do a more detailed analysis. Um, but does it appear to be a naturally occurring product? Um, and can you, both of these go to, can you identify something in it that is markedly different in structure? Structure can be in a chemical molecule sense, or it can be in, if you think about a food or um, something like a vegetable, if it's been processed, does it change the physical properties of that food or natural material in some way so that it has a physical structure that's distinctly different from what was originally found in nature. Uh, and both of these, if it's, if it's not markedly different, the B, then it's the patent office would say it's not patent eligible and they're not even going to rule on whether it's novel, obvious, the other normal aspects. Um, and if it is, if it meets the criteria, uh, is different in structure, then that gets over this initial patent eligibility threshold 
the application is still, the claim is still going to be examined based on all the normal criteria as far as utility, novelty, non-obviousness. Um, but it's clear from the guidelines that the Patent Office is going to be much more aggressive about expansively applying the Supreme Court's ruling in Myriad um, to the point where there's some indication that they may even start to extend this to method claims, which most attorneys would say extends way beyond what the Supreme Court has held at this point. Um, and as I'll come back to talking about tactics at the end, um, may be something that we need to wait for courts to work through case law and provide us with more of a check on where the Patent Office has gone. Um, but so here I'm going to run through very quickly a couple of specific examples provided by the U.S. Patent Office. Um, this is a make-believe acid that they, they have postulated something called Amazonic acid that was isolated from the leaves of a tree growing in the Amazon. And the point being that if it's just purified, extracted, isolated from these leaves, that still doesn't make it patentable subject matter. But if having done that, some chemist determines the structure of amazonic acid and then goes make a, a different chemical compound, their example is this 5-methyl amazonic acid using chemical synthetic methods that doesn't exist in nature, even though it's very closely related, it's distinctly different in structure, the 5-methyl amazonic acid is potentially eligible, it's patent eligible subject matter, and if it meets the other criteria of patentability, could be the subject of a patent. Um, another example is in the metal area, just a pure mixture of copper and tin as separate metals mixed together, no matter what the size of the particles, is not patent eligible subject matter. But if a patent, if a, if a metal alloy has been made from the two, and metal alloys typically have very different properties from the individual metals, that has always been and will continue to be patent eligible subject matter. Um, perhaps one of the more controversial uh, examples they've provided is the, quote, pomelo juice example where palmella juice is a naturally occurring juice. Uh, it by itself is not patentable. Just claiming pomella juice and a added preservative, um, the patent office would say that this is not patentable subject matter because the preservative could be itself a natural product. And the Patent Office has said that they will consider this patent ineligible subject matter even if that combination of pomelo juice and the preservative, a naturally occurring preservative, would never exist anywhere in nature without someone deliberately making the combination. Um, and I think there, there's still quite a bit of controversy as to whether that is a correct interpretation, but this is what the, the patent office, the position the patent office is taking, uh, telling its examiners to take. If the preservative is, a, now we've said preservative X in caps, um, a specific preservative, and now we're here, if, if preservative X is a, some sort of synthetic, non-natural uh, preservative material, then the combination would pass the PTO guidelines test and would be considered patent eligible subject matter. Um, and then in, I'm just going to take a few minutes at the end here and go back to some of the cases I mentioned at the beginning with a more detailed look at the claims 
and talk about now whether post myriad the patent holders would perhaps not have been as successful in enforcing their patent. Um, the first example here was the Lyco Red tomato product patent. I mentioned it had both product and process claims in it as originally uh, involved in the litigation. But the product claim here, I've, I've given you a shorthand version of it, but what you can see is it's really at the level it was defined, an extracted tomato pulp where the liquid fraction has been removed and then it's been dried down and then the concentrated tomato serum is arguably just a dewatered version of some substantial other portion of what had been removed from the tomatoes and then these are added back together in a controlled fashion. It is quite likely that the patent office would come at this and say this is just all just natural tomato material and we don't consider it to be patent eligible subject matter absent some demonstration by the patent holder um, that there's been some transformation in the physical state of the tomato here. Uh, and as I said earlier, I think this goes beyond where the Supreme Court has gone so far, um, but I think what we are likely to see is that in patent infringement litigation, the patent office has promulgated these guidelines and it's very likely that the attorneys defending uh, food companies in a litigation like this are going to bring out the same type of arguments and it remains to be seen how those will be received by a court. But I, you should just be aware that if you've got a patent and you're, it's sort of a pre-myriad patent, you've only got a food product claim and it's of this sort, you're very likely to see a challenge to the, to the patent eligibility, the enforceability, the validity of, of those claims on that sort of basis. Um, but if you have process claims, um, where it's very clear when you start to look at some of the steps here, there's been some kind of transformation, uh, some change in the physical state, and it's also, there's, there's a much stronger argument by the patentee that the Supreme Court has expressly not ruled on these type of claims, and the myriad precedent shouldn't apply to these, having a separate claim to the process is very likely going to give you a stronger prong, at least until we get some different enunciation from the courts, to pursue in parallel with the food product claim. I can see I'm, I'm running short on time here, so I'm going to flip to, but I wanted to get to one or two more of these. I think this one is an important one because this is the pharmaceutical composition that was prepared by a process that I mentioned before would, you know, there was no process claim because when you look at the process, the process steps here are really quite mundane. It's really using this to select a particular fraction. But it's also clear from this this is just one piece of the cocoa beans that existed initially. I haven't shown it, but it's clear from the claims and the description in the patent that this can be done to beans that have not been processed in any way, just green coffee beans. So it's very, very likely that if this were filed with the patent office today, the patent office would just say, we're not even going to look at this application. It's not directed to patentable subject matter. And if Mars were to try and go enforce this patent tomorrow, I think it's very likely that this would 
receive the same sort of challenge from a defendant in an infringement suit. The companion claim that at least was not in this particular patent um, that would provide a much stronger position for Mars would be if they had shown a particular pharmaceutical efficacy versus some kind of disease or condition and to have a, me a pharmaceutical method of treatment claim, it's pretty clear from there's strong arguments in the, in the Supreme Court's myriad decision to argue that the Supreme Court has expressly indicated that that was still patentable subject matter and would provide an analog means to go after the infringement litigation. Um, I think I'll go back to, and this will be my last example, the, uh, the dual textured pet food, they had claimed it as a food product, but the food product itself was really claimed as what I would call a product by process claim, where I haven't included all the language, but at the end of that claim you can see there's some description of the configuration of the food, and then it says, and is formed by the co-extrusion, and there was some additional language that defined the, the conditions relating to the co-extrusion. That's still arguably, when you look at this, um, and the requirements of that claim did not necessarily require any different physical properties, physical transformation other than the, quote, shape of the food. And the patent office very well might deny that type of claim on patent eligibility ground. But the patent also had, as claim 17 or whatever, met the, the parallel co-extrusion process claims. And when you look at those the, the steps that were included in those claims, it would seem to be that those quite clearly would be patent-eligible subject matter. Whether or not they're patentable based on the type of steps and the novelty and obviousness sense is a different question. Um, but so the two, two of the examples here, or, or actually all three examples, I think emphasize going forward if you have a food product that would be borderline patent eligible because of this natural product issue, the importance, if there is innovation in the processing, which is often the case, to come at it from a processing, uh, claim the process as well as the food product. And with that, since I'm five minutes over, I will stop and uh, hand the mic back to Mike here. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, I know that we are uh, just about the end of our hour, but we have a few more um, questions, really good questions and comments, uh, that I'm hoping our speakers can deal with. So if you'd want to hang on for those, great. Um, Rick, the first one is for you, and it's, it's a combination of a comment and a question. Uh, can you explain for those people that aren't familiar with design patents, that design protection is not product class specific, so potentially broader in scope of protection. Uh, and also important to note clearing, since an unrelated product could present an issue. Uh, can you comment? Uh, yes, that's actually a, a very good question. The, in, in the design patent world, as, as the question mentions, it, well, I'm sorry, back up. In the trademark world, when you register a trademark, you have to register it for particular goods, and those goods are arranged into a particular classes. So if you were clearing a trademark, you would focus on the goods and the classes in which you're going to use it and compare it against how a, a similar mark may be used the same way Delta Fawcett and Delta Airlines can coexist because uh, they're in totally different uh, uses. Uh, in the design patent world, uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, the, you remember we were talking about the shape of the uh, America, the United States outline uh, for the Kraft cheese uh, uh, macaroni product. Um, that's a design patent. It's irrelevant what that product is made from, whether it's macaroni, chocolate, or whatever it may be made of. 
if someone is selling a product that looks like what's seen in the picture there, then that is an infringement. So um, that, that creates a, a real problem when you're doing a, a, a searching process. You know, you're coming out with a new product and you want to do a search to make sure that your new product will not infringe the rights of a third party. Uh, you, when you do your design patent search, you know, you're not searching for other chocolate products or other macaroni products. You're searching for other products of any kind that have that particular shape. So it, it is more of a challenge and, and, and somewhat different from what you experience in the trademark world. Thanks. Uh, Rick, another question that came in for you by email. What are your thoughts about filing for the trademark on the sub-register earlier than five years after active promotion and sale? Yeah, for those of you not familiar with the supplemental register, that is, uh, you know, trademarks that are, as you might say, not quite ready for the prime time yet. They don't have the, res the, the necessary distinctiveness to be entitled to registration on the principal register. And certainly one strategy you can follow is to go ahead and register a trademark uh, on the supplemental register before you've got that five years or, or, or certainly some length of time uh, of use of that mark in the marketplace. Um, it, you know, it's a challenge to figure out whether or not you should go ahead with a supplemental register. And, you know, it's, it's dependent, uh, it's fa fact specific in each case. If, if it were a case in which we had um, followed the, the strategy I outlined of getting in the design patent and then coming later with the trademark, I probably would not uh, pursue the supplemental register. I just rely upon my design patents until I've had enough time to accumulate the necessary uh, years of, of use in the marketplace to go on the principal register. If it instead were a case where maybe we missed the opportunity to file a design patent, and, and the only opportunity is, is trademarks, uh, then certainly a, you know, one strategy would, would be to proactively go out and file for that uh, uh, supplemental register first. Um, it, it all kinds of depends on, on timing as to when, when you're thinking of filing versus how long you've been in the marketplace. Because if you've already been in the marketplace for two, two and a half years, I probably wouldn't bother with the supplemental register. I just let it sit for a little while longer and then pursue the registration on the principal register. One thing what I don't like about the supplemental register is, is that it does constitute a public admission that at the time the mark was registered that it didn't have any it didn't have the requisite recognition or goodwill in the marketplace and I I'm always hesitant to make that public admission if we, if I don't have to so uh, those are my thoughts on that question Mike thanks okay and Charlie uh, one follow up for you on the uh, PTO guidelines. Uh, the U.S. PTO guidelines appear to be much more extensive and restrictive than the Supreme Court's holding in its myriad decision. How do you foresee the treatment of natural products evolving at the patent office and in the courts? Well, I think we're going to see a more restrictive treatment by the patent office for the immediate future than you may get and enforcing existing patents. And most of the existing patents were issued pre-guidelines. And, and you know, it's clear from the Supreme Court decision and, and what looking at it and the commentary afterwards that there are now a lot of patents out there that would not have been issued and are clearly no longer valid, uh, which, which is a big change in the status quo. You know, the, starting with the ge genetic ones that really follow the exact fact pattern or, or mirror the exact fact pattern in the Myriad case, there is the clearest indication as you get further down that list and, and out into other products. And in particular, if you go to method claims, I think you know, the Supreme Court is, is not gone anywhere near where the Patent Office has. Um, so I think you're, you know, what I would counsel people is, and I think most people agree that over time there will be case law that will restrict the patent office's interpretation. So you shouldn't write cases as if that's the final answer, but you may need to be prepared to go to battle with the patent office and if 
anyone's familiar with patent practice, to file continuations, which is sort of daughter, granddaughter applications, to keep the case alive while the case law evolves. Uh, it's more likely that the delineation of the case law will occur as people with existing patents go to enforce those against people, and they're sort of in this middle area where it's unclear what the court and the Supreme Court's treatment might be, and we start to build more case law. Um, that will then give us arguments to um, go back and uh, argue with, with the patent examiners or seek to get the guidelines uh, reined in somewhat. But I think there's going to be an, an evolution over the next five years at least um, because it was such a fairly dramatic shift in what everyone had taken to be the status quo in terms of patentability of isolated natural products. Okay. Well, that concludes today's program. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, for those from New York, New Jersey, and Kansas, today's CLE code is M. P S J. Uh, we invite you and encourage you to contact either Rick or Charlie if you have additional questions or would like more information on their particular topics. Thanks again and have a good day. That does conclude today's